precautions. Come in Tango Alpha Charlie. Do you read me? Over. We read you loud and clear. Over. What is your altitude? Over. We're holding steady at 4,000. Repeat, 4,000 feet. I can hear you, but I can't see you yet. Over. Please check on ground conditions. Over. There's a slight breeze down here. Nothing to worry about, though. It's only about four or five knots blowing south-southwest. You'll pick it up as soon as we light the smoke flare. Look out for the telephone line to the north of the field. Also, take care not to get near the sports pavilion. Over. The sports pavilion? Over. Yes, there's a telephone line running from the northeast corner to the north of the field. I reckon they should avoid that whole sector, just in case. Over. Right. We're going to turn in for our approach. Over. Please give checklist. Over. Right. We throttle back the engine and slow down. Once the door is open, I shall count down and cut the engine right back as they jump to avoid any turbulence. Over. I'm going to light the flare. Over. Watch you don't burn your fingers this time. <laughs> Over. Very funny. Over. I can see it. OK. Door open. Counting. Five, four, three... Two, one, one out, two out, all out, over. I can see them. One, two, three, all shoots open. Here they come. Advice and suggestions. Scene one, Ralph's house in London. Yes, boss. Have you seen this in the morning paper? Let me see. Semi-literate. Half-wit. Least intelligent. I don't think you like the film, boss. It's Anderson again. I'm going down there to see him. Um, should I come with you, boss? What? Yes. Get the car. If I were you, I'd punch him on the nose, boss. That's what I'm going to do. You want to really show him this time? Well, let's go then. Uh, boss... Don't you think we'd better tell Sam first? Huh? Yeah, perhaps we should. Get him on the phone. Scene two. Sam is Ralph's manager. Samuel Compton? Sam, it's me. Ralph. Oh, hi, Ralph. Did you see the paper? Yes. I'm going down to see Anderson now. What? No, you'd better not, Ralph. Leave it. Did you see what he called me? Semi-literate? He's a critic, Ralph. That's not criticism. It's... it's libel. He's not going to get away with it. All right, Ralph. Calm down. Perhaps you ought to talk to a lawyer. A lawyer? Hmm. Maybe you could sue him. I'll sue him for every penny he's got. Yes, well, why don't you just phone a lawyer? Go and have a talk about it. Scene three. Mrs. Spencer is Ralph's lawyer. Mr. James, do come in. Take a seat. Did Sam speak to you? Yes. Mr. Compton showed me the review. I want to sue. I would strongly advise you to think it over most carefully, Mr. James. I've thought it over already. The best thing you can do is to forget all about it. Look, you're my lawyer, aren't you? Sue him. I don't think we should, Mr. James. The review was in one newspaper. Not a popular one, either. Very few people will have read it. Probably few of your fans read the more serious papers, if you don't mind me saying so. If you sue, there'll be a lot of publicity. Bad publicity. You know the saying, mud sticks. But it's Anderson again. Do you remember what he wrote about my marriage last year? But you may remember that his report was true, Mr. James. Really, I suggest you forget it. You mean, I shouldn't sue? Exactly. Hmm. Well, I'll just go down there and have a little talk with him. I would recommend you not to do that, Mr. James. Really, my advice is to forget it. The Importance of Being Earnest Oscar Wilde's comedy, The Importance of Being Earnest, 
was first performed in 1895, and since then it has become the most performed play in the English theatre. They say that every Englishman is, or wants to be, an actor, and amateur dramatics are certainly a popular pastime. Local groups from churches, schools and clubs perform plays in small halls all over the country, and this is their favourite play. On any Friday or Saturday night in the winter months, it is being performed somewhere in the country. In this scene, Jack Worthing is being interviewed by his prospective mother-in-law, the formidable Lady Bracknell, for the first time. You can take a seat, Mr. Worthing. Thank you, Lady Bracknell. I prefer standing. I feel bound to tell you that you are not down on my list of eligible young men. Although I have the same list as the dear Duchess of Bolton has, we work together, in fact. However, I am quite ready to enter your name, should your answers be what a really affectionate mother requires. Do you smoke? Well, yes. I must admit I smoke. I'm glad to hear it. A man should always have an occupation of some kind. There are far too many idle men in London as it is. How old are you? Twenty-nine. A very good age to be married at. I have always been of the opinion that a man who desires to get married should know either everything or nothing. Which do you know? I know nothing, Lady Bracknell. I am pleased to hear it. I do not approve of anything that tampers with natural ignorance. Ignorance is like a delicate exotic fruit. Touch it, and the bloom is gone. The whole theory of modern education is radically unsound. Fortunately, in England, at any rate, education produces no effect whatsoever. If it did, it would prove a serious danger to the upper classes and probably lead to acts of violence in Grosvenor Square. What is your income? Between seven and eight thousand a year. In land or in investments? In investments, chiefly. That is satisfactory. What between the duties expected of one during one's lifetime and the duties exacted from one after one's death, land has ceased to be either a profit or a pleasure. It gives one position and prevents one from keeping it up. That's all that can be said about land. I have a country house with some land, of course, attached to it, about 1,500 acres, I believe, but I don't depend on that for my real income. In fact, as far as I can make out, the poachers are the only people who make anything out of it. A country house? How many bedrooms? Well, that point can be cleared up afterwards. You have a town house, I hope. A girl with a simple, unspoiled nature like Gwendolen could hardly be expected to reside in the country. Well, I own a house in Belgrave Square, but it is let by the year to Lady Bloxham. Of course, I can get it back whenever I like, at six months' notice. Lady Bloxham? I don't know her. Oh, she goes about very little. She is a lady considerably advanced in years. Ah, nowadays that is no guarantee of respectability of character. What number in Belgrave Square? 149. The unfashionable side. I thought there was something. However, that could easily be altered. Do you mean the fashion or the side? Both, if necessary, I presume. What are your politics? Well, I am afraid I really have none. I am a liberal unionist. Oh, they count as Tories. They dine with us. Or come in the evening, at any rate. Now to minor matters. Are your parents living? I have lost both my parents. To lose one parent, Mr. Worthing, may be regarded as a misfortune. To lose both looks like carelessness. Who was your father? He was evidently a man of some wealth. Was he born in what the radical papers call the purple of commerce? Or did he rise from the ranks of the aristocracy? I am afraid I really don't know. The fact is, Lady Bracknell, I said I had lost my parents... It would be nearer the truth to say that my parents seem to have lost me. I don't actually know who I am by birth. I was... Well, I was found. Found? The late Mr. Thomas Cardew, an old gentleman of a very charitable and kindly disposition, found me and gave me the name of Worthing because he happened to have a first-class ticket for Worthing in his pocket at the time. Worthing is a place in Sussex. It is a seaside resort. Where did the charitable gentleman who had a first-class ticket for this seaside resort find you? In a handbag. A handbag? Yes, Lady Bracknell. I was in a handbag. A somewhat large black leather handbag with handles to it. An ordinary handbag, in fact. 
In what locality did this Mr. James or Thomas Cardew come across this ordinary handbag? In the cloakroom at Victoria Station. It was given to him in mistake for his own. The cloakroom at Victoria Station? Yes. The Brighton line. The line is immaterial. Mr. Worthing, I confess I feel somewhat bewildered by what you have just told me. To be born, or at any rate bred in a handbag, whether it had handles or not, seems to me to display a contempt for the ordinary decencies of family life that reminds one of the worst excesses of the French Revolution. And I presume you know what that unfortunate movement led to. As for the particular locality in which the handbag was found, a cloakroom at a railway station might serve to conceal a social indiscretion. Has probably, indeed, been used for that purpose before now, but it could hardly be regarded as an assured basis for a recognised position in good society. May I ask you, then, what you would advise me to do? I need hardly say I would do anything in the world to ensure Gwendolen's happiness. I would strongly advise you, Mr. Worthing, to try and acquire some relations as soon as possible, and to make a definite effort to produce at any rate one parent of either sex before the season is quite over. Well, I don't see how I could possibly manage to do that. I can produce the handbag at any moment. It is in my dressing room at home. I really think that should satisfy you, Lady Bracknell. Me, sir? What has it to do with me? You can hardly imagine that I and Lord Bracknell would dream of allowing our only daughter, a girl brought up with the utmost care, to marry into a cloakroom and form an alliance with a parcel. Good morning, Mr. Worthing. Away from it all. I've thought about it for many, many years. I've wanted to set up my own place where goddamn people like Freud aren't worth a hill of beans where there ain't no rules, and where people don't give a damn about doing an honest day's work. I'll work like hell and build a place for myself and my grandchildren, and then I'll die a happy man. That's my dream, and now it looks like it may come true. I had been to Pitcairn first, and hell, you couldn't wish for a nicer place. The people are just like Virginians were fifty years ago when I was growing up. They were so happy and kind and pleased to see me, and when I said I was figuring on living near them, they just near about flipped they were so happy. We took off for Henderson. God, was it stormy. All the rest of the fellas on the boat got sick, but not me. I was that screwed up inside with excitement that I didn't feel a thing. It took a couple of days sailing, and then we got there one afternoon. <laughs> it was just what I wanted. Flat as a pancake. Good beach. Landing place. Jungle thick as hell, mind you, but I figure I can clear that. And the weather's about as perfect as you can get. Seventy every day. A little rain once in a while. Just a great place for old smiley Ratcliffe to come and settle down. So that's what I'm figuring to do. You the jury. Cross-examination by the prosecution. Lady Wyatt, would you describe yourself as an intelligent woman? I would never describe myself as anything. I'm not stupid. Do you not think it was stupid to put that scarf in your bag and walk away without paying? I intended to pay. There was nobody to pay. You couldn't have looked very hard, could you? Look, I've told you, I had an appointment, I was in a hurry. Surely not in such a hurry that you couldn't find someone to pay. Surely you could have spent a few minutes. Surely your friend would have waited. I don't like keeping people waiting. I'm never late. Couldn't you simply have put the scarf back and collected and paid for it later? I, I suppose so. I, I just didn't think. I intended to pay for it later. But you didn't pay for it, did you? I've told you ten times already. I simply forgot. Every shoplifter says that, Lady Wyatt. I am not a shoplifter! Hmm. <clears throat> now, um, these pills. How long have you been taking them? Four or five years. They calm me down. And in those four or five years, have you ever suffered from loss of memory or forgetfulness? Not that I know of. And have you walked into shops, taken things, put them in your bag and walked away without making any effort to pay? No! 
No, no! But you did on this occasion. You took a scarf, put it in your bag, and made no offer to pay. That is theft, common theft. Huh? If we accepted your claim that you simply forgot, then every Tom, Dick, and Harry would be walking in and out of shops, taking whatever caught their eye. No, 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 Lady Wyatt, I forgot is no excuse at all. I maintain that you intended to steal. I believe many people do that, just for kicks. It gives them a, a thrill. That's not true. But it is true, Lady Wyatt. No further questions, Your Honour. Cross-examination of the defence. Lady Wyatt, you're a very wealthy woman, aren't you? Wealthy? Yes. I don't know about very. But you don't need to work. No. How often do you go shopping at halls? I don't know exactly. I suppose once or twice a week. So in a year you would probably spend hundreds of pounds there? Yes. So there is no reason why you should want to steal anything? A scarf worth ten pounds, maybe. Of course not. It's quite ridiculous. Have you ever been in trouble with the police before? No, never. Not even a traffic offence? No. Nope. And you're a well-known figure in the community? I suppose so. I do a lot of work for charity. And you say that you just forgot to pay? Yes. Well, that's easy enough to do. I've done it myself. And I imagine many people in this court have. And of course... You would have returned to pay as soon as you realised. Yes. I would have realised when I got home. Thank you, Lady Wyatt. No further questions, Your Honour.